Thank you guys for being patient. <laughs> um, first question um, is for the director. Can you go further, go into further detail about what inspired you to create this film? No. Um, <laughs> um, so, as you saw in the film, there's a scene where you know, I describe having somebody stand in line and just the frustration of having to do your business through a barrier and honestly just makes everything a lot slower and a lot more tedious, a lot more frustrating. And honestly, if, if I'm a if I'm going to be holistic, like it wasn't my idea and that's necessarily for the film. Um, there was a gentleman who was standing in front of me at the Congress Heights Post Office, which is on Southern Avenue. And we were both just irritated because it took us an hour to do nothing. And as we're waiting in this hour, he literally says, yo, man, like, why do they treat us like this? And I was like, yeah, they don't do this, you know, up in anywhere else, any post office I've ever been to, you know, if we go up Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, that's a nice post office. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we should do something about this. And I was like, yeah, let's do something. He was like, all right, bet, I'm about to break the glass. And I was like, that's not gonna work. <laughs> that's, that's not gonna work. <laughs> but from that, you know, interaction, it, it made me realize, you know, I do have the ability to try and do something. We all have gifts. My gift is social agitator through films. You know, I just decided that's how I will get my message out. Okay, and not break the glass. I don't want those problems. This is from a requirement. I don't yeah. even think you need to say through film, just social agitator. Like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know? Okay. Person, <laughs> social media. <laughs> yeah. List all of it. Go ahead. Yeah, we're, going, we're just going to get you a business card and okay. say social agitator. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. For the other panelists, uh, what was your initial reaction to this film and kind of like, what is your personal connection to it? Uh, ladies first, Kayla. Ladies first. Yes. Uh, so, I don't know how we met. I think he kind of just walked in the art gallery. Um, so I'm the founder and executive director of Carnage Heights Arts and Culture Center, uh, which is the first art gallery and space of its kind in Carnage Heights. Woo! First and foremost, thank you. She's also a dope artist. Oh, thank you. Okay. First and foremost, we're an art gallery, um, and we specialize in solo exhibitions, and if you're an artist, you know that's a rarity. Um, but we also do classes and workshops, so sip and paint, sewing classes, yoga classes out the wazoo, um, and then there's real space for our community. We're the only rental rooftop, and maybe the only rooftop in Congress Heights. So he walked in and said that he was doing a documentary and talked about what it was talking about. Um, and I'm born and raised Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that's the first time I said Southeast like that. I'm born and raised Southside. Um, and so it's just near and dear to my heart. And whenever we get a chance to tell our story, then we tell it. And especially when we get to tell it from our perspective, um, from being born and raised, not from somebody that has moved in, um, a transplant, as we like to call them, mm -hmm. um, but just like from the heart of the story. And I just respected the fact that he was getting to the heart instead of just talking to anybody and everybody. He was getting the real story. And so I, I definitely wanted to support him. Yeah. Uh, Wale. Uh, I mean, for me, it was, uh, well, I mean, I'm also a groove, so that's how I know kind of, um, you know what I'm saying, groove by groove, such a partnership with Cobra Hill, shout out to DC Gray. Talk about your podcast. Uh, shout out to the Deltas, hold on now. Oh, no. you know, we just no. love, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, also, um, I'm a co-host and creator of uh, Unfiltered, the podcast, we're a DC-based podcast. My other co-host, Martina Baxter. Hey. And we just got our first female co-host, you know what I'm saying? Throw your hand up. Hey. Yeah, to the ladies. You know what I'm but uh, um, my family's been in D.C. forever. Like, my uncle, my great uncle is Reverend Willie Wilson. So, like, you know what I'm saying? Union Temple is my family church. So, when he was like, I'm doing a documentary about D.C., I'm like, oh, what's up? We, we could talk all about it. It's all day, every day. You know what I'm saying? I've been in Southeast all my life. And so, when he was doing the post office, I was literally at the post office like two weeks ago. And it took me like an hour and a half to mail off something that took like two minutes. So it's just like, you know, it's, it's a thing. Like when you see the, the gentrification side, I definitely had to come out and talk about it and be a part of what he was talking about. 
Okay. Um, so the next question, like the movie highlights the prevalence of bulletproof glass in these neighborhoods and the effects of the psyche on the customer. Do you agree with this assessment? And do you have any personal experience with it? The every day. <laughs> um, actually, some of some of the 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 experience that I had that I've had with it, I've kind of cut out mm -hmm. just because it does it does play a role in the psyche. For the example, I mean, the best example is the post office. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily go to Carnage Heights, but I do go to the one on Alabama Avenue right beside the Safeway, and it's the same situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I've moved to getting boxes, my own stuff, like just having them at home and doing the label. You print it out at home, and then all you gotta do is drop it off. You don't even need to get a receipt or scan it. Just take the box mm -hmm. and let it go. Um, <laughs> And so I think in there, like, when, when if I can't do that, I have to plan for, I just can't have anything next. Like, mm -hmm. there's nothing to do after the post office, just in case, because that's how crazy it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what was said in the film about the level of hostility that it brings is real. Like, you could come in there and be just okay. <laughs> but as soon as you walk in there, it's this space of, like, full-blown protection and, like, stay back type situation out to the point like wherever I go I try to build a rapport and a relationship with anybody so even if there is that situation I still know Fantasia in the back you know what I'm saying <laughs> she helped me out you know what I'm saying um Miss W she helped me out so I, I know people by name mm -hmm. and so those are the things that help me when I have to experience that um Congress Heights Arts and Culture Center is right across the street from Hong Kong um which is all bulletproof and is run by Forgive me, I don't know if they're Asians or Vietnamese or whatever. Um, it goes under underneath Asians. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah, there you go. I'm terrible with geography. I'm an artist. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> it's just certain things we don't tap into. Geography, <laughs> math, science. Anyway. Um, but even for that, you know what I'm saying? Like, you go in there and you want to eat. The same thing like the brother was saying. He wanted mambo sauce and the lady like almost cut his throat off because he wasn't getting wings. He just wanted mambo sauce. You know what I'm saying? So there definitely is this this disconnect that it that it creates and when you're at home you don't want to have a disconnect like that you want to have a connection you want to know that you you're in your community you got people to speak to so i definitely think the barriers i mean barriers do what they're meant to do and yes it, it does what it's supposed to do it creates a barrier it creates that separation it creates a hostility it doesn't make you feel welcome um so yes very accurate assessment what about you wally and when did you discover that there were so many barriers around? So I mean, like for me, honestly, I guess because I grew up around it, it didn't really like dawn on me. Okay. You know, so, like when she's talking about Hong Kong, I used to go to that area all the time mm -hmm. as a teenager. And, like as a kid, we go in there, get fries and mumbo sauce. You know, you're not thinking about the fact that it's a plexiglass between you and the lady you order your fries from, because that's this is what you do. You go to Hong Kong, get you know what I'm saying, fries, salt, pepper, ketchup, mumbo sauce, and stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, and you go about your day, but. I guess like it took for me to go other places because um, it was interesting. I went to Lincoln University. Shout out to the first HBCU. Yeah. We're not talking about you right now. Though. But, nah, so you know, I went to Lincoln, and Lincoln. If anybody's ever been up there, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? So like, Lincoln is Lincoln. That's all it is. But they have like they got the Chinese stores out there. You know what I'm saying? But there was a Chinese store that had the plexiglass, and it just kind of threw me. I'm like, I'm in the middle of Oxford, Pennsylvania. I saw like Amish people with the cart and buggy, like, what do you guys have the plexiglass for? So I guess when I came back home, it was just kind of like, I mean, it might have been, I guess. I didn't know. I was just like, all right, this looks like at home. So, you know, I ordered my food and I left. But then I moved to Silver Spring. Ha <laughs> ha. And then things changed. <laughs> the post office was self served. Everything was open glass. There was no, like, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have to talk to nobody. The plexiglass. I'm like, oh, this is different. Y'all real safe up here. So, like, it's comfortable. You know, like, it just it felt more comfortable. Like, I fell asleep in my door a lot one time, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Have you, have you ever been to the DMV in Georgetown? No. Oh, it's amazing. I, I went like once. I went literally once. It's and amazing. I was like, oh, okay. It's amazing. You sound like it's like a vacation. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going tomorrow. I've got plans to go tomorrow. <laughs> I'm glad they closed over on Pennsylvania Avenue. Is that one? Which is now Planet Fitness. 
Just get, get yeah. your wealth in. Yeah, get your health in. Okay. But I just wanted to add, like, mm -hmm. when you have, when you see these things, like, and almost the normalization that goes on, just where these things are, where they're not. Um, you know, one purposeful thing I did was, within the film, I didn't let people, like, I have tons of footage of people talking about crime, we get interviews from people from the police. And the one thing that I noticed, when you, when you look at crime, especially across the city, and this is gonna sound real crazy, so go with me for a moment. When you control for murders, when you take murder out of the equation, right? Meaning, and most murders happen intra-community, meaning I'm going to kill someone I know or someone who I know who knows that person, which means these are crimes of proximity, they are not crimes of randomness. Yeah. So you've taken that out of it. In the communities which are the wealthiest in the city, they're the ones that suffer the most person-to-person -person crime, especially when the person doesn't know that person, i.e. muggings, robbings on the streets, robberies of, or burglary of the homes. Why? Because, let's be honest, in these other communities, like, if this is my neighbor, if this is my neighbor, I know what you have, because the same thing I have. <laughs> you know, you might only think you know what I have. Or you might not have what, what I mean is, you have, it's, it's a relative proximity. If I really want to have a come up, if you will, I'm going to go to the Palisades. I'm going to go up to Ward 3. I'm going to, you know, I teach at American University. I'm going, if I really want to get someone, right, I'm going to, I've seen the inside of those homes through the windows. They don't use blinds. They don't. I, that is such I a can easily, why? Is that I can acquire goods from their homes just by driving by because I can stake out without even making a pass. And I say all this to say, Without these person-to-person -person irritants, when you think about the addings of weapons unnecessarily, you think about like how easy it is on the south side or even up and up, you know, in certain places uptown to acquire firearms, require a violent weapon, right? Like there, this myth that it's, there's more crime in these areas. There's more. There's this myth that says we're going to do harm to business owners. Realistically. We're only aggravated, we're only irritated, we're only trying to go at, like, like the, the, the level's only escalated because we walk in and immediately you've let us know we're not welcome. As you all saw, there was a shot of a Papa John's with pizza, pizza hole, like a pizza box holes in it, right? Like literally the only thing you can do is slide your pizza box in and out. That, that right there, that's not, that's not normal. That shouldn't be normal, that shouldn't be ingrained. But unfortunately, some people in this city I've learned to accept that as the reality. Um, <clears throat> next question. Uh, a child in the film talked about owning a business, and when you asked them where they could own it, they said 8th Street instead of their own neighborhood. How does this how does this issue affect the future generation? And what did that statement mean to you guys? Um, I actually know that child, and I know his father. Um, and transparency, his father is no longer on that avenue. Okay. Um, that business is no longer on the avenue. And the question was not could he, but where would he? Mm -hmm. um, so he could very well, but he knew better. And I think that was very smart of him. Um, I have children. I have two. I have a two year old, actually, he's three now. And I have an eight year old this weekend. Um, and they're definitely in the they they they're definitely south side, so they're a little they're a little biased because they they want to break their mom is south side everything, so that's all they see. Um, but I think it it just speaks to the evolution and the common sense, mm -hmm. and especially when you're talking about business, like if you really talk about business, you. Well, first of all, I would say you, you got to talk about what kind of business you're talking about. Okay. Um, so, like, I'm in the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. So, my nonprofit work and the, the mission of my nonprofit is to be right where we are. Mm -hmm. He's talking about a tattoo shop where he needs to be lucrative. Okay. The same reason why his father's tattoo shop is not there right now because it's not lucrative. Like, it's not going to work right there. Mm -hmm. And I think our children are starting to, I think every, every generation that comes, Thank God, and hopefully we just get smarter and we get more educated. Like Coy, um, Mr. Dunstan was talking about secrets in nature, uh, just about how different generations we can we get smarter about how we need to take care of our bodies, and we get smarter about the food and different things like that. 
the generations, they, they get smarter. And so to have a business like that, he knows based on how things are now, that it's not lucrative. He can't stay there. But like he said, he need to go somewhere where it's popping. A Street is popping. He damn straight. U Street is popping. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, for a business like tattoos, a lot of the stuff you want, you want walking traffic. Yep. Appointments and all that type of stuff is cute, but you want walking traffic. Okay. So I think um, when you're talking about, that's what people have to think about, not just just building business about what type of business they're doing, what their mission, what their vision is, you know what I'm saying, like what they're trying to touch. And for that particular business, he damn straight. He need to go where it's popping at. And so I think it just speaks that our that our that our generations they are paying attention. That we're paying attention, we're figuring out which way to move. You know how like you drive and instead of just looking at the car in front of you, you look a couple of cars in front of you so you know to stop and not to stop all crazy or turn the lane. That's what's happening. We looking forward and we're knowing which ways to create our actions now to be to make sense later on, not to be an accident, you know what I'm saying? Because we didn't think and because we didn't we didn't look ahead. Okay. But that's not to say those venues won't work in our community. Oh, yeah. it's, it's it's that you have to work harder to drive your business in and those conditions. And and the one thing like unfortunately it's not here. Um, but speaking to him and even going up to the new shop, like what you're not gonna make rent in the way that he was doing business. Like his brand wasn't established enough to make the rent to pay the other artists to have even them making their booth rents and all that. Like he had a I forgot the square footage, but it was a it's double the size of this room for a tattoo shop. You know? It was and six artists part time, right? So that's not going to necessarily make the rent of that space. However, that's not to say like, you're sitting there saying, oh, well, can I have a lucrative business? I mean, you look at Marathon, I hate to say it, like, if you look at Marathon Clothing, since everyone started paying attention, that retail space is larger than this bus boy's location. They made their rent, they had, you know, they're making their price points. And the purpose, but the thing was, they were doing it in a way that would drive business to them. They had multiple ways to street, you know, have income and things. So I think it's one of those important things that we should always reiterate, like, our, the youth are watching and saying like, all right, it's easier to do something here, right. but then we should also reiterate to the fact that, yeah, you can make it easy, but doing also what the right thing may not always be easy. Not saying that the easy way isn't the right way, but mm -hmm. you can have a larger impact. Freehand King while it was there had a larger impact than it does right now in Georgia Avenue. But. And that's why I think I go back into like, what is your mission? Is it really just to make money or is it to make an impact or is it to do both? Like where you, like you gotta think about the first stop of what you really trying to do. Okay, what about you, Wally? You're just quiet. Yeah, I'm just like, you know, I'm just taking it all in. I see this. Do you but think like, it's got the buzz? I, I mean, no, it's like, I, I think about it, but like, it's, I think the thing that was interesting for me is when he was talking to the little boy, he was saying how he would work and live on H Street. Yes. Now, like, okay. the, the working part we kind of discussed, but like, the living part is what's kind of key because like, mm -hmm. that's real estate and that, that property there is going to be outrageously priced, like, you know what I'm saying? So if he has that the ability to like, procure that. You know, so that's that's a legacy he's building for his children. You know, what I'm saying they'll have something that they can go back and look to, and you know, that's literally net worth for his family. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was really interesting that he brought that up, like to say that he would live close to where his business is, because a lot of people that have businesses in the city don't live in the city. Okay, but but one question about that. Say that again for the people in the back. You know what you say? They, they don't live in the city. Oh, okay. okay. You know, you got business in Southeast, but you live in Alexandria, say. or you got business in downtown. Well, and you live in, in, in Bethesda, you know, it's like, it's, Real it's, life. it's, it's a thing. Okay. Um, but did you find it interesting he didn't say he wanted to live in Southeast? Uh, I mean, a little bit, yeah. But I guess, as a child, if like, if you're not shown like all the positives of what can be going around and like, what's pumped to you through media and stuff like that, it's all the negative, yeah, of course you're not going to want to be there. Because, you know, as a kid, every time I go somewhere, or even as an adult when I went places, Everybody like, oh, where are you from? You from DC? I'm like, yeah. No, what part? If I told you, you wouldn't really know, but you know, I'm from Southeast. Oh, you're from Southeast? Yeah, I am. Oh, well, you're dangerous. I mean, yeah, but I'm still educated. We can be civilized and have a conversation. It doesn't mean, like, you know, like, it's, I'm there to promote this. And I think that, I mean, I think that's real talk. I don't think, I mean, 
mean, if you had a conversation with anybody for real that knows, that really knows DC, it's only a certain amount of people that's gonna say that they wanna live in South Beach. Okay. Like literally, I was out at, um, I was on A Street, mm -hmm. which is super, like, that's my best example every time, even when I was in, in school, because I, as in the video, I had the same reaction. Like when I went to school, it was like, you from South Beach? Like, huh, what? Um, but I was on A Street, which you know is Capitol Hill, which is Southeast. Like, yeah. you look up and at the streets, it says Southeast on it, right? But they call it Capitol Hill. Exactly. Extended. So we were right. Or Navy Yard. Yeah, or Navy Yard, or Barracks Room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so actually. That's Southeast. I was. Exactly. I was on Southeast. Exactly. That's Southeast. Right. So I was in Southeast on Barracks Room, uh, at Brick Lane, if you will. I have to walk my dog. Yeah, Brick Lane, yeah. Um, and so I was actually there the other night. Um, and I was sitting there, and there was two friends that I've known forever. And there was one girl that I didn't know. And the friend that I've known forever, she kind of made a joke with the other girl, knowing the expectation, like knowing her reaction. And she was like, oh yeah, she's from Southeast. And the girl was like, uh-uh, no I'm not. I'm not from South. I was like, baby girl, calm down. <laughs> it's okay. Because at the same time, like you're doing that whole reaction, but you're sitting here in Southeast in a restaurant. You get what I'm saying? But this is this whole east of the river. Like when you cross the bridge, it's a whole nother conversation. You get what I'm saying? And so I think people, most people, that if you ask them, do you want, like, would you want to move to Southeast or would you want to live in Southeast? The only people that are really honestly saying yes and not looking crazy, like that girl looked crazy on Barracks Row, are white people. Um, are people that really understand and know real estate. Right. Um, yeah, and, and implants. Like you said, the undergraduates that's looking for a place to live, but that's slowly tearing down as an option because the prices are going so high. I literally have a house that was sold two, do two doors down from me um, and like at the, I think it was like 740000 mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So for me, that's good for me because it raises my my house. You know what I'm right. saying? Come up. Yeah, and like Hillcrest, people don't know the the history of Hillcrest, but that's where Cleveland was supposed to live before he went to Cleveland and became Cleveland Park. You know what I'm saying? But when you go to Hillcrest, you get that same little quiet, white picket fences, dogs walking, birds chirping, and that's Southeast. You know what I'm saying? And that's where I was raised in, and it's always been that way. Okay. But because it's Southeast, no one looks at it, except for the white people, except for the, the transplants, and except for the people that really understand and know real estate. And that's where it needs to go. Like, we have to understand all of those things around the city. And that'll, like, that'll just change our whole, that'll change our whole narrative if we really have a real understanding of it. Okay. Um, in the film, there is a euphemism used called Black Gentrifier. Um, and then also like Jay-Z, like he did this little freestyle oh, yeah. to Nipsey Hussle and he's like, we need to gentrify our hoods. What are your opinions about that? I'm good. I mean, but like in the other way, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, so what, like, what other I, way? So like in the sense of like, I mean, I don't, I'm probably using gentrification as like a problem. Yeah, some people had a problem with yeah, that, yeah, that actual I'm, word. I'm gonna own up to it. I'm probably not using it correctly. But I feel like, you know, I moved out of Silver Spring and I'm back in Southeast. I'm saying I'm in the house now. Put the mic closer. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. I don't like putting stuff in my face like this. Um, <laughs> All right. But this is a G-rated show. This is a safe space, Yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's so, talk about it. Send it to the back of it. Okay. But anyway, yeah. Let's talk about it. Okay. Right. Anyway, back to um, what you're saying. So no, I feel like you know I was like one of those people where I was like when I moved out of Southeast, I moved to Suitland first. And then I left Sudan and moved to Silver Spring, but I didn't move because I felt like it was like my community. I wanted to get away from something. I moved because it was closer to work. Because I was working with Bethesda and I was working in various places. But like I always wanted to ultimately come back to DC because I didn't like the fact that there were people moving into our neighborhood that weren't necessarily there for the community. Okay. So like the street I grew up on, I grew up in Xenia Street, and like the families that have been there have been there for like decades. Right. You know, and it was like. Growing up, I started seeing them, you know, some of the parents got older and their kids might have left or, you know, the grandparents passed away and then they left the house and the kids sold it. And it's like, white people over here, Asian couple over here, you know, and then they're building like new community center, 
and then all of the property value is rising, which is great to some degree, but then you're pushing out all the people that live there because they can no longer afford to live there. So I feel like we should start going back into those neighborhoods, back in the property, and it's like, we kick the white people back out. You know? Okay. Um, yeah, I say we should like all go up to uh, Chevy Chase, and, and just, everybody just, you just collectively just buy blocks and just kick all their, just let them know how it feels. Like, Chevy Chase is kind of like this. She said no. She said physically irresponsible. Yeah, bro. I mean, if we are not buying blocks in Southeast, we damn sure can't go up to Chevy Chase and buy it. That's what I said. Southeast. What the hell are you talking about? That's why you do Southeast first. We all we go ahead and lock that down. But like, but real quick though, so, I have so my thing about I have one of those unpopular uh, opinions. Okay. I'm on Twitter all the time, and they do that unpopular opinions. Um, about gentrification and I will give transparency that a lot of my my perspective comes from my father is a developer okay um, a little bit more transparency my father is also a transplant to okay. DC a little bit more transparency my father is from Mississippi mm -hmm. came here in 63 you want a great migration yeah. yeah, like my father in no shade, like everybody, literally everybody laughs at this and y'all can't too, it's fine. Um, but it's true that my father used to pick cotton. And I'm not laughing at that, that's hard. And he told me that like his first bike was bought with cotton picking money, right? And so when he got to DC, he was just moving forward better. You know what I'm saying? He didn't really know what he wanted to do. So when he got here, he was at Sears and Robux when they were still around. Um, he brought like the cable to the city. Um, just did a lot of stuff. And then he ended up in real estate. And so what I've learned in that whole space of like, and there's a whole different conversation for black developers in the city. So that's a real conversation. But I hate the term, or I hate, in the conversation of gentrification when we use the phrase pushed out. Okay. Um, and I don't like that because we have to get to a point where we're not pushed out. Like for example, right now, can't nobody push me out. I have a house on Bangor Street in Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the deed to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, can't no, but nobody can push me out. So I always talk about what is it that we're not doing. We're not owning things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's so, the so that's the thing. So when we talk about that, we need to get to the point where we're being educated to get to ownership. Yeah. Whether if we're renting, then we need to figure out rent to own. We need to figure out spaces that we're keeping our stuff so that we can't be pushed out. Mm -hmm. um, because there's two sides of that conversation. Because with this whole term of gentrification comes revitalization. Right. You get what I'm saying? And with re revitalization, we need that. Right. Our, our, our places, they fall down, they break down, people don't come. We have businesses that can't thrive because people aren't coming. Right. What revitalization does is bring people over here. Mm -hmm. Bus boys wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for gentrification and revitalization. Okay. But what that happens with, that trickles down is, it trickles down to the other businesses. When people come over there, they're like, hmm, okay, what else is over here? Let's drive up the avenue. Mm -hmm. and, and, <laughs> right? and, that, like, and that's a great point. I mean, it's real life. Like, you know what I'm saying? There's right. a, the manager here, she contacts me and asks me about how we can get art in this space. Right. That helps my business. Right. When the ESA, the Entertainment Sports Arena came, that's you know where the Wizards and the Mystics and all that's gonna be, we're a part of a, a community benefits agreement. Yeah. And the community can be a part of that. But what we don't do is we don't go to ANC meetings and we don't figure out what's happening. We don't go to development meetings, and trust me, they have them because our sister company does the community engagement forum, and they do the, the meetings and the, the public meetings, and no one comes out right. because they're after work, okay. and we're tired, right. and we don't want to come. We have to spend the time to, one, educate ourselves on the opportunity, and then take the chances. And if you don't take the chances, the table, like people saying, oh, well, you never gave me a seat at the table. No, the seats are there, baby. You just never sat down. And on that note, we have to sit down. And on that note, since we're, we're about to wrap up, Sure. Um, we're gonna like we're gonna give it over to the
understanding how to actually uh, buy real estate and actually how to change your environment is truly necessary. But we're gonna open it up to the audience. I at least wanna have one question. Um, does anybody wanna? Yeah, come, come up. So um, first of all, thank you for um, doing the documentary. I thought it was um, excellent. My question is, um, what is your plan? My question is, what is your plan on application of the actual documentary? Um, when you talk about this intersection between gentrification, education, and violence, I think it's key for our students to be able to understand this. And then you're starting to scratch the surface of what we call urban literacy now, and making sure kids understand the environment that they're living in, but not just what individuals and the symbols that they're given, but the, the depth of it. So my curiosity is, what's your plan on, on presenting something like this to a wider variety of individuals, not just people um, that's having this conversation right now? Yeah, and since we have limited time, we're just going to direct that question to the director. <laughs> Go ahead. So, in terms of wider application, um, so I think first the thing that needs to happen is, like you said, urban literacy needs to needs to instruct people what's going on. I mean, realistically, I did this mostly because I'd never seen anything done like it. I'd never seen anyone ask the questions that I'd asked. I'd never, every person I approached about interviewing, whether it was the gentleman who asked the question or whether it's the, well, I actually interviewed both of them for the film, you know, the way editing works. Sometimes not every person's perspective gets um, encapsulated. But the questions I, were, I was asking was specifically, have you ever thought about this? Has this ever actually formulated in your brain to really question what's happening? And the thing is, for me, the first thing is we have to teach the youth or anyone who's listening realistically what questions to ask. It's really great to go to school and to ask questions after your teacher has spoon-fed you facts of information and to walk you through how to think. And that's realistically how American education works. We only ask and expound more of which we've been already presented. But the thing is that people gloss over things and it becomes mundane to you, it becomes innocuous. At that point, you have no real understanding of what's actually happening. So when we're talking about social structures, it's a damn shame that me as a sociology instructor, the only time that I really have these conversations is when I'm in controlled forms, i.e. my classrooms or i.e. places where I've been invited to speak. And we need to have more of that understanding of how our, how our environment realistically interacts with our actual living in our actual spaces. So the first thing is, I mean, maybe I wouldn't show this version to the kids. There's a lot of motherfuckers in it. But <laughs> what I would say is with that is turning it to ask to get the kids, the students to understand like, hey, this is what's happening in your community. If you feel some type of way about this, let's go about formulating the right questions to ask to then understand what systems are in play. How does local politics feed into this? What is an ANC meeting? I can tell you, I lived in DC like as, as a fully grown adult for many years without understanding what the ANC did. I know what the office was, I had no idea what they did. I've been in DC my whole life, but I don't even know what ANC is. When she said it, I was like, don't no worry, don't no worry. Our, our ANC reps are the same. Right? Yes, and we have three neighborhood commissioner Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner. They are the they are the segue between um, the city council basically and your neighborhood and you. Like if you need something for your neighborhood or for your hood, you talk to the ANC and they should get it done. And they are elected non-paid positions. Non -paid. They are only there either as their own vanity or they're supposed to be doing social good. So the thing is to remember. These are people who are who signed up to work, to work for, for you. you. Exactly. Okay. Uh, next and last question. Hi everyone. Uh, hi. Hi, Mr. Jones. Hello. How are you guys? Well. Um, I'm probably at the elevator here in this room. Uh, sorry okay. I'm late. Thank you. I uh, just left the meeting from um, down at Check It. Uh, don't. How many heard? Of don't be DC. We're, we're meeting also. So this whole issue of gentrification really got us wound up. And you know the success we had over at, um, what's the name of it? The place where they were six. Metro PCF. Metro PCF. The 
go-go music, exactly. But I wanted to also give you all a little history of why it's so complacent that it seemed to be complacent. Uh, East Little River has gone through quite a bit. We are still trying to get over the crack era. We have had at least two generations of people who were affected by crack. And that, of course, you know, that was all over the country. But here in D.C., we have to recognize people have taken advantage of that. They see that we were basically asleep. And so the numbers, oh my God, they're over here, this wonderful area. And they have, we have uh, uh, the river, Anacostia River. We have these valleys and these hills and so forth. And uh, sure, come on over. We do, did not understand that the best way we could survive was to buy. Buy, especially back in those days when it was, you know, little or nothing at that time. Now it's almost out of the reach of most people. So we got to say, how can we waken people? How can we help these families, strengthen them? Parents are still struggling with working with, with their own children. The children themselves are struggling. They've been traumatized and still in so many different ways. So I just wanted to add that to that. Um, you know, you're right, people do not go to meetings. Um, a lot of times, go to meetings, they're fighting. See, they right? <laughs> you know each other. You don't want to go to them. So it's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I hope that all of you all are, are in to try to see if we can turn all this around. And can we just give Ms. Brenda Jones a hand? Because she's really a legend in Southside. If you've been here, then you know Ms. Jones and Parkland. She's done a lot of work for East of the River. She's an activist, right. full blown down. Thanks. Uh, so, well, that concludes our panel. Um, if you have any questions for the director or anybody else on this panel, you can talk to them after this. Uh, we want to thank you for coming. We want to thank you for staying and really enjoying and understanding what's going on. Clap for you guys. Just really quickly, I would like to thank you all for your support, whether you were part of the film, whether you were in it, whether you gave money, spiritual support, mental support, whether you listened to me gripe, all of those things. I would like to thank you all for being and Oh, and I submitted this film for consideration for the DC Black Film yeah, Festival. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you have of course, you know how to reach me, um, and I would bless them. Like I said, make sure you take a picture in front of that stop and repeat thing outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're trying to be professionals. All right, then. So sad. All right, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, good name. If I can just have your attention.